Well, tonight we come to our finality of our foundations classes. And this one has been sort of an add-on to some of the times we've done this in the past because normally it's a five-week course, but tonight is the sixth week. And one of the things that is special about tonight is after all that we've learned in the five weeks about the foundations of our faith and about the fact that we can understand God and his creation, we can understand man and his separation, we can understand Christ and his salvation, we can understand the Bible and God's revelation, and we can also understand the church and the believer's participation. Well, what are you gonna hear tonight in great anticipation, huh? What is it, what's next? Well, you know what's next? It's the fact that we got to put all of this in application for our church family here in Living Springs. Because it's no good to know all those foundational things and then to not be able to put them into practice in our personal lives, individually, corporately, collectively, as we're part of this church. Because at the end of the day, you really only get to live your Christian life out in the context of your local church. Remember, there's the universal church of all Christians everywhere. There's the local church, which is a community of believers in a locality who gather together under the lordship of Christ. And I left this board up here for a minute because I want to use it as a springboard because tonight we're going to talk about us. We're going to talk about the identity of Living Springs Christian Fellowship. We're going to talk about the identity of um, our sort of role, I believe, in our community and, 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 and in the time we're living in. And we're going to give you some things that are just kind of the blueprints and the, and the vision and the mission and the values and the philosophy of what we do and why we do what we do and who we do it for. And so that's kind of what is coming up tonight. But I'd like to begin, because it's always a good place to start, with the great commission that Jesus gave in Matthew chapter 28. So if you have your Bibles handy, Turn there, Matthew chapter 28. This, of course, is called the Great Commission. One, because this is the greatest purpose we could think of to live our lives. And it's a commission because you're working as co laborers with Jesus, you're cooperating with Jesus, you are co workers. And this is a mission that Christ is giving us, and it's a commission. And it says in Matthew 28, verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Amen. Now, this beautiful promise of God, because it is a promise, because he says, I will be with you always, and, and he told us earlier that I will build my church brings together two very important concepts. Jesus intended to build his church as his disciples went on to make disciples. But what if Jesus had his disciples go out there and preach the gospel and people responded and they received Jesus as their Lord and Savior, but they had nowhere to gather? What would happen if we were a bunch of scattered individuals just living the Christian life, all of us on our own, do you know how many things would just not be portrayed to the rest of the world? You see, before Jesus went to the cross, he prayed a prayer. And his prayer had more to do than just the multiplication of the church, although that was really important to Jesus. But he also cared so much about the unification of the church. And so if you'll hold your place here or turn to John chapter 17, to see these two passages side by side is so beautiful because this is the prayer of Jesus for his disciples when they would make disciples. <laughs> and look at what he prayed. 
praise. And I just love this. I'm going to start, the whole chapter is beautiful, and we don't have time to go through the whole chapter, but I do want you to notice this. Look at verse 9, where Jesus says, I pray for them, but I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are all yours. They are yours. And all are mine, and all are, I'm sorry, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now jump over to verse 20. I do not pray for these alone. So he's not just praying for the 12 apostles or for the disciples that he had gathered in his ministry, but also for those, verse 20, who will believe in me through their word. So you see, Jesus was confident the great commission would be fulfilled. He says, I'm praying for those who will believe through their word. Then look at verse 21. For what goal? Well, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you, have, that you gave to me, I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be, may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. One more verse. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. Now, when you look at a passage of Scripture like this, and you see the heart of Jesus and the prayer of Jesus, do you remember that when we were talking last week about the church, I brought you backwards to the Old Testament when Jacob was laying down and he too was dreaming ahead of time and seeing in vision of this ladder that would connect heaven and earth. And that on that ladder, angels would be ascending and descending. And when Jacob was laying there, he took the stone that he was laying on and he set it up as a pillar. And then he put oil on the pillar. And we learned that Paul the apostle said in 1 Timothy 3.15, the church is the pillar and the ground of truth. Well, one of the things we've learned is that he called the place Bethel, which means the house of God, and I'm going to erase this here. And when you think about all the different ways that God has chosen to build his church throughout the world, I want you to notice that God still gives vision. He still speaks to people and gives them direction as to where to go to start his church or how his churches could be birthed in various places. And one of the things that we know every time a church is built, it's built on the foundation of Jesus. He's the chief cornerstone. Every living stone are the members of the body of Christ, the church. We need the oil of the Holy Spirit to really help us do the work. The Father is overseeing it all, and it's all in that oneness, just what Jesus was praying, that we'd be one body, one Lord, one spirit, one faith, one hope, one baptism, because he's the one God and Father of all, who's above all and in us all and through us all. And we learn that Jesus has been calling apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for 2,000 years. He's been working through different gifted people who will equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And our goal is to exalt Christ, to edify the church, and to evangelize the world. We do it through the practices of teaching, fellowship, the breaking of bread and communion, prayer, praise and worship, house meetings and public meetings, and practical works and missions and witness. And this represents a great picture for us of, of what happens with the church when it's established. But tonight I want you to think about our establishing and our beginnings. Because, you know, when God led me to plant this particular church, it came off of some time spent with the Lord while in England, where God had called me to plant a church over there, as many of you know, in Cambridge, England. When I left New Jersey in February, February the 1st, 2007, I went to a country that I had never, you know, lived in before, had visited a few times on missions trips and personal visits, took my wife there. She only got to go visit it one time before we moved there. And 
when we moved there, we had, let's see, we had a five-year-old, we had our two-and-a-half-year-old, and then we had, oh, we had three-year-olds. Josiah just turned three. That's true. And then we had, my wife can correct me on that. She's, she, she knows. And then we had a baby on the way. So we, we landed in Cambridge, England, and, and we didn't know a single person in the city. So we, we arrived at a house that I had to go a few months before and see if I could rent. And when I put the application together, it wasn't even a guarantee that we had it. I had to leave because it was the only place that we really found that could work. And we just had to put everything into God's hands. And so when we finally arrived, it was just me and my wife, two small kids and a third on the way, and a vision from the Lord that he wanted to build his church. He wanted to make disciples. And he wanted to reach people in a place that had sent out missionaries a long time ago, but now God was sending people back into a country that had become largely atheistic, humanistic, and post-Christian. And even though we are indebted to England for the English Bible that you all have in your hands tonight, so many don't know the Bible at all over there. And they're not taught scriptures well over there. And they're confused as ever today in 2023 questioning whether or not they should even have the name of God as he and as father and it's just a confused country like so much of what's happening around the world. But God gave me such a strong vision to go there that no matter what hardship we faced, I was able to be anchored in the fact that as the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 24, he who calls you is faithful who also will do it. And, and the Lord started teaching me about the church while I was there from the ground up because we got to see a church from the ground up. And so much of what I've laid out for you and these different things came from all that time of just not just learning from what the Bible taught, but doing it, literally doing the work that the Bible tells you needs to be done to see this church go forward. Fast forward 10 and a half years later after we landed there, uh, we were able to leave the country, turn the church over to the British leadership we raised up, and didn't know what God had for us next. Uh, we had some opportunities to pray through various things, like taking over churches that were already established, churches that needed pastors uh, from California down to, you know, uh, southern states like Virginia, North Carolina, and then New Jersey, thinking, okay, does God want us to come back to New Jersey? What does he have? And there were some specific things the Lord spoke. And I want to start with that, and then I'm going to just lay down some things about how beautiful it is when God begins to do his work. One of the verses that the Lord spoke very powerfully to me about had to do with what I just erased, the life of Jacob. And so if you have your Bibles in Genesis, turn, go to Genesis now, God really spoke to me through this passage in Genesis 35. And What's interesting about Genesis 35 is this is the second time where Jacob returns to Bethel, the place that he got the vision of Jacob's ladder where the angels were ascending and descending. Well, this was his return to Bethel and God was calling me to return back to my home country with a mission heart, almost as if I was a missionary back to my home country. And I really wanted to see uh, God restore things that had been lost and bring people back to the understanding of of the church being a body and a family and, you know, not just people being passive spectators, but active participants. And, and this is one of the things the Lord spoke to me. Look what it says. Genesis 35, verse 1. Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. And Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel and I will make an altar there to God who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me in the way in which I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands and the earrings which were in their ears and Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree which was by Shechem. And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were all around them, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan. He and all the people were with them, and, they, and he built an altar there and called the place El 
Bethel, which means God of the house of God, because their God appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brother. And let's stop there. Something that was really striking to me was that when God told Jacob to go back to the same spot where he got the vision of the house of God, this time there were going to be things that needed to be different. He was told to put away any foreign gods, anything that was foreign, not true to what God intended for the glory of his name and the purity of his practice of what his church was. He said to purify yourself. You need to have a heart that is pure. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. You can't be bringing in other selfish ambition or ideas or other things with it. It, it needs to be pure and change your garments. Things might look different. And that, this was really interesting. You know, when you change your garments, you are putting off the old, you're putting on the new, you're saying, God, this is going to require a fresh set of clothing, a fresh work, you know, that God you want to do. And, and I want to say to you that, you know, God has directed my life at certain significant points in ways that I just cannot deny. Do you, do you remember a couple of weeks ago when I taught you guys the foundations of the Bible and God's revelation and we ended on the will of God and how I said there's the standard will of God, there's the specific will of God, and there's the sovereign will of God. The standard will of God is what God demands of all people in all places at all times. God's standard, the word of God. Then there's God's specific will, which is what God desires of certain believers at specific points in time for specific purposes. Like when God called Jacob back or Abraham to leave his house or Jonah to go to Nineveh and on and on it goes. Then there's God's sovereign plan, which is what God determines to do for all people throughout time, despite what people do in time. <laughs> God's going to accomplish his will and his purpose. And when you see the Bible in light of those three different ways of expressing the will of God, it puts a lot of things into perspective because God does specifically lead his people. Is that true? The Bible says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. The Bible says, a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. The Bible says that he leads us on the paths of righteousness for his namesake. So there's no denying that Jesus is personal, God is personal, and he directs his people in personal ways. Now, when I first got the call to England, I was fasting and praying just out here in Freehold, technically Manalapa now, but it used to be Freehold back in the day, Mammoth Battlefield. I fasted and prayed on May 9th of 2006, and when I got my call to England, I had pre presented three things to God that were concerns of mine if we were going to move our family all the way across the pond to the United Kingdom. And all throughout that day, as I sought the Lord and prayed and had my Bible, reading it carefully and prayerfully, I presented those things to the Lord. And I didn't get any clear answers from God until I went home that night and I made a phone call. And at literally uh, 10 o'clock at night, my phone rings and it was a brother I met on my first mission trip to England who was awakened in the middle of the night in England, which is three o'clock in the morning there, five hour time difference. And God spoke through him and really answered the prayers I had prayed that day. And I didn't even tell him what I prayed. In fact, he had to find my phone number in his old phone that he had gotten rid of and took the SIM card out and put it into his new phone, found my number. God woke him up with such fervency and urgency that he had to call me. And so at three o'clock in the morning, he's calling me. And at 10 o'clock at night, I fasted and prayed. And God is now speaking through this brother, confirming things about my call to England. Does God specifically lead? Absolutely. And there were many things God spoke to me on that phone call and things that confirmed God's will. And then when I went to England on our next mission trip, he confirmed some more things there as one of the sisters got a vision of me preaching in Cambridge and she didn't know I was praying about going to Cambridge and we were praying for a church to be established there. And there were others praying and seeing visions of it before it even happened. When we got called back to America, the Lord spoke very clearly to me in a lot of different passages related to Bethel, the house of God, but then God spoke to me about the three wise men who visited Jesus, if you remember, at his birth, following the great star. And when he followed that star, when they followed that star and they arrived on the scene, it wasn't in um, the place 
where the manger was because it says they, they were now in a house where they saw Jesus and they presented their gifts. But you remember there's only one verse in the whole Bible that tells you about how the three wise men returned back home and it's Matthew 2 verse 12. Matthew 2 verse 12, I'll just tell it to you by memory. You don't have to turn there. It says, and being divinely warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country another way. And I went, you know, I read that verse and it was like on a time when I was also fasting and praying there in England, God spoke so profoundly to me through that one simple verse. What, what does that have to do with a new start for me in, back in America? Well, the wise men were returning back to their home country and like you saw with Jacob, they were gonna be changing their garments, so to speak. They were gonna be putting away some of the foreign things that they picked up there and they were coming back filled with God's presence. They had been around Jesus. They had worshiped him. And four things stuck out, stood out to me. One, it says, being divinely warned in a dream. See, God used the star to get them there and a dream to get them to a new location. God doesn't always work in the same way for all people at all times. You, you, there's no recipe and formula when it comes to these kinds of things. But God has a way of speaking to his children because his sheep know his voice. And the Lord goes before his sheep and they follow him for they know that voice. John 10, 4 tells us that. So the Lord was showing me, Joey, I am calling you. It's gonna be different the way I'm gonna call you this time and it's not gonna be the same mission and the same thing, but it is a divine call nonetheless. But then he says not to return to Herod. And I thought, what, 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 Lord, the Lord had me stop on that. And he says, I have a word for you about this. Herod represented a pseudo Christianity, so to speak, a, a false presentation of Christianity. Because if you remember, Herod wanted to kill Jesus, but he pretended that he wanted to worship him. So he had a form of godliness that denied the power thereof. And so as a result, Herod uh, was was actually um, wanting to take away the life of Jesus, not add to it. And the wise men were warned about it. Don't return to Herod. And the Lord was showing me that even back in America, there's been so much commercial consumerism and celebrity status of Christianity and things that you need to be very careful not to get wrapped up in and be involved with because God wants his house to be pure. He wants worship to be in spirit and in truth. And he doesn't want there to be flesh involved and, 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 and to make it just about, you know, um, uh, you know, what, what building the Tower of Babel, which is to make a name for yourself. He wanted it to be to the glory of his great name. So that was what God showed me about the Herod part. Then it says they departed to their own country. So the Lord was saying, Joey, I am calling you back to your home country. But then it says another way. And that was the part that was so interesting. What's the another way? What, what's going to be different about this time around? Well, when we came back, um, Calvary Chapel, which is the churches I've been a part of for, for many, many years. Um, I was at the original Calvary Chapel. Many of you know the movie's coming out this weekend called The Jesus Revolution and it tells the story of Chuck Smith. That was my first pastor in the movie where Chuck gets baptized, or sorry, where Chuck baptizes so many of the different people is the same place I got baptized by Pastor Chuck in that same water uh, when I was just a little boy. And uh, later on, as I grew up and matured, God used Chuck and uh, ordained me as a pastor. And uh, I became a youth pastor and an assistant pastor. I started leading an evangelism ministry and, and uh, teaching apologetics in the school. And I was, doing, I was a youth pastor and doing all of that. And the Lord had called me from Calvary Costa Mesa um, to the East Coast after 9-11 happened. Uh, Chuck Smith's son-in-law, um, Brian Broderson, had introduced me to Lloyd Pooley, who was the pastor of Calvary Chapel Old Bridge, and we had breakfast together, and God orchestrated something there, and I became a youth pastor over there, and for four and a half years did that, and took missions trips, and did all kinds of things, and redeveloping the youth and young adult ministries until the Lord called me uh, to England in the way that I just described a little bit ago. But when I came back, I didn't know what the next steps were gonna be. I just knew this. God wants to expand his kingdom and he doesn't want it to be about any one, you know, sort of, it's not about one denomination or over another. It's not about one, you know, banner, but Jesus being the highest banner of all. And I just was with open hands before an open heaven with an open heart saying, God, lead and guide. Whatever you have, I just want to follow in your footsteps. I want to follow what you have. And during that time, 
as I was seeking the Lord and praying, and there were lots of changes going on around the country, and even within the Calvary Chapel, it was going through some shifts and some changes, and there was different things happening. I just waited, just kept waiting and praying and waiting and praying, and, and uh, some of us started praying together, and uh, there was Dennis and Grace Henderson, who I'd married before, both who were widows, that God had me marry them, and then there was, um, you know, Mike and Christine Duquesne, and, and there was just a small group that was starting to slowly build, and we eventually started to see that team grow, and and as we started praying, we started a Bible study out of my house on Friday nights, as well as prayer meetings during the week, you know, on a Tuesday. And, and, and we did that for about a good year. But as we grew in that Bible study, we discovered that it got too big in the houses. And we were moving from one house to another, three different houses on Sunday mornings. And the Lord was trying to sh- sh- show us where, where is he going to plant us? Where is he going to... And, and all around that time, and even in the beginning of that, I had connected with some people from what was called the Christian and Missionary Alliance who were praying for new church plants and new church planters who said, you know, we, we look for people who are called by God to invest in. And what we do is we invest in them. And then when, when the church gets up off the ground, you know, we just ask that as the church gets established, then you would invest right back into the same sort of funds and the same sort of, you know, network that we could do the same thing for others. And as we sought the Lord and prayed about it, And some of you know, as we had our accreditation service just in January the 15th on that Sunday, we um, went through that whole process and God, um, through the partnership of that, not only helped to support and and see this church off the ground and planted, but we did it in partnership with the Christian Missionary Alliance and with open hands to just work across all the churches that are like-minded with the gospel and to work together and see God do a great work in these days where he would pour out his spirit and build his church. And when the church was established, um, even just in the homes, because I believe that, you know, the church got established before that accreditation service. That was just sort of an official thing in relation to requirements we had to do with the CNMA. But for us, Jesus had already established his church based on the biblical blueprints that were given in the scriptures. And this building that we're in right now was a provision of God. It was sitting here vacant for three and a half years. Many people called on it to take over, you know, to try to meet in this building, and, and they were just, the people who owned the building were not interested. And once the Lutheran church that owned this building had sold it, they were just going to um, knock it down, redevelop it, and so forth. That's still the plans that the owners would still love to do, but now it's in God's hands because it's a part of God's narrative, so <laughs> whatever God wants to do, he's going to do. But what I want you to know is that the Lord had redirected us when we were going to go start the church meeting at a school. We fasted and prayed again, our leadership team at the time, and all those who were involved in, the, in our core team. They, we all felt like the Lord was saying, no, not yet. Don't, don't move into that school. And what we didn't realize was that, you know, God was going to provide this building for us. And two days later, when we, after the fasting and prayer time, and we didn't go into the school, the Lord spoke to me about calling on this building, and I literally was at the intersection of Park and Main, and the Lord said, Joey, you need to call on this building. I told you to call on it. And uh, it was at the prayer meeting when he spoke to me, and it was Thursday, so it was two days after the prayer meeting, and I called right at the intersection and explained our situation, how the Lord put this building on my heart again, and how I'm a pastor, and we have a church family, and we're just looking for a building, and, and I presented this whole thing, and this girl took interest in us, and said, you know, Joey, many have called before. I know I've talked to you before, but, you know, I'm going to present your situation before the management, and maybe they're going to do something different this time. She was struck by what I said, and I got a phone call the next morning, and they provided this building for us. Isn't that awesome? So amazing. But, of course, the church is not a building as it relates to a noun. The church is meant to be building, as it relates to a verb, disciples. And so that's why, looking at all that we have here, let me turn this around now. Okay, let's move this here. All right, there I am. Okay, so as you look at this, we see that Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. And when God is is building a church and he's doing a new work, it's really important that we understand that there's a vision that God gives. There's a purpose we have to always get grounded in. And what you have to do is seek the Lord to make sure you are clear on what God is saying that is not only biblical for all churches, but what might be even specific in was written into the DNA, so to speak, of what God's doing at this time with this church. And 
what we, what I believe a vision is, is what, it's what God wants you to see. Every one of us has physical vision, which is what we see. Spiritual vision is what God wants you to see. It's what Jacob got when he got the, the vision of Jacob's ladder. That's not something that Jacob saw. It's something that God allowed Jacob to see. So it was a spiritual vision. And spiritual vision that God gave was threefold. And, and I love, as an easy way to remember this, that, that there's this see aspect to it, which is to see Christ glorified. Everything we do needs to be about the magnification of Christ, but also to be the church, not to go to church only, but to be the church, edifying, building one another up as a verb. And then to, and this was a unique part that I think has culturally been lost in our modern times. So many people go to church as spectators, but God was calling, how do we help people become active participates? How do we activate the church? So it was to free the living spring in every believer. Because Jesus said, out of your hearts will flow rivers of living water. He told the woman at the well when she was trying to draw water from a physical well with physical water, that he had living water for her, which would spring up into everlasting life. And that's where the name living spring came from. And that's why the church today that has been planted here is Living Springs Fellowship. And so we want to see Christ glorified, be the church edified, free the living spring in every believer until we are fully unified in him. Because remember what Jesus prayed? That we would all be one in him, even as he is one with the Father. Because the oneness is what was so important about the church, even in Ephesians 4 and John 17. And oh, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. That's where God commands the blessing. So that is the vision of what we want to see, what we believe God wanted us to see when the church was established, and what we want to see as the church continues, okay? Is we want to see this. But we have to have a biblical purpose. The church has a purpose for its existence. Now, this right here, ultimately, I would say should be like almost like the purpose of every single church. The vision might be a bit unique in different places based on where you're at, what time you're living to some extent, but the purpose of the church is this. We exist to glorify God by being true followers of Jesus. Amen? Amen? Who are full of his word and filled with his spirit so that we might fulfill, notice the play on the words, fulfilled, fulfill, in order to fulfill his life-giving mission of making disciples who will make more disciples. And isn't that what we read in the Great Commission? Do you see how everything that we've just shared so far tonight has a total biblical continuity to it? We took it, everything is straight from the word on what Jesus wants for his church, commanded for his church, has called for his church to make disciples. On the back side of that board, we saw all the blueprints of what the practices of the church ought to be. But of course, the church exists in different places all over the world. So sometimes vision might look a little different in some places. Culture might play a part in different churches. If you're in Asia, church might look a little different there or in Africa or, you know, in England, there were some things unique there and then America. Culture does play a, a, a bit of a part in, let's say, how worship might sound, how people might dress, um, how people might interact together in certain ways. Do you greet with a double kiss or a one kiss or a hug? Or in England, it was like a dance of like shake, hug, no, uh, oh, just don't do anything. <laughs> it was a little bit of, we had all kinds of different, you know, kinds of people, because we had over 30 countries represented in our church in England. Um, it was a very multicultural church, and so we learned about a lot of different ethnic backgrounds and cultural backgrounds, but this right here is really important. It all starts with what Jesus said. It all has to do with what Jesus gives as vision, it has to do with Jesus' moving of, of the Spirit, and that we might be a church that's set apart for Him. Now, with that said, I'm just going to share a few more things, and I'm going to have... Um, a couple of the elders come up with me tonight and um, share, you know, like just some of their perspective on some of this, because I'd love to, for them to fill in some of their narrative and story, and then also you guys can ask us questions internally about the church. But there are, there's, a, there's some core values. When we think about like how we're going to do this, there are some core values that I want to write down that I want you to, um, to just take note of about how to keep the vision in focus and to work out this, this vision. Um, these values, let me write that up here. These values are values that I think you'll probably, as I write them down, say, yep, that, that makes sense of why we do what we do 
in Living Springs here. Uh, the first is the centrality of Jesus Christ. So let's write that down um, or just take note of that. The centrality of Jesus Christ. Now, when, when I put down Jesus here, you notice that's, that was a part of our first part of the vision to see Christ glorified. And we really want Jesus to always be in the center simply because although the God is a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Spirit testifies of Jesus. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Just so you know, a Christ centrality includes the triunity of God. It's keeping Jesus right in the center, but understanding that God is triune, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that's why that's at the top. The second value that's really important is the continual feeding of the Word of God. So one of the things that we're always going to be committed to here is the continuing feeding of the word of God. Now, why? That's because Jesus says you are going to be sanctified by the truth. And your word is truth. So we have the centrality of Jesus Christ and we have the continual feeding of the word. We want to be a church that's biblical. Biblical in our practice, biblical in our focus, biblical in our perspective, biblical in our understanding. Because remember, as we said last Sunday, if we don't really know the Bible, can we really say we know God accurately? Because you might have some ideas about God that are just not really biblical. But you might say, but I had the experience. Because listen, I give you a lot of subjective personal experience. Say, Joey, how do you know that, that all those things? Well, listen, at the end of the day, God has to confirm his word. And if people are following them by the Spirit, they're accountable to God. But there should be evidence that when God's doing something, he establishes it himself. He's the ultimate confirmer and will make sure that there's fruit that will come from it. So you have the centrality of Jesus Christ, the continual feeding of the word. And then we have this, and this is something you'll notice that we're very, very committed to, which is the full reliance on the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit was given to us so that we are a people who will not just do things in our flesh. The Bible says the flesh profits nothing. It's the spirit that gives life. Now, when the Holy Spirit was given, he was given as the comforter. He was given to convict us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He was given to testify of Jesus, to conform us to Jesus, to sanctify us, but to empower us so we could be his witnesses. We need to rely on the Holy Spirit because that's how this whole church got started to begin with. It was spirit birthed. It was spirit led. And we want to follow the leading of the spirit and just be sensitive to what he wants to do in times when we're just going to wait on him or just be open to his leading. Our prayer meetings is a non-agenda service for the most part, completely just seeking God together. In our Sunday mornings, we give some space and times, even though that's probably our, our most full service of trying to do all the practices in one shot because it's that Sunday morning Lord's Day service, but we still give space and time to see how the Spirit of God might want to guide and redirect and change or just let us linger in his presence so we really want to be spirit-led in our men's ministry, women's ministry, youth, young adults, children's ministry. We're praying and seeking God in all the areas where the church is making disciples. That brings up the next one. If the Spirit of God is really working, moving, and having his way in the church, there will be, and this is important, the ongoing practice, the ongoing practice of of sincere love. This should be a loving church. If we are truly a church after God's own heart, we will love one another. Jesus says, by this, the world will know who are my disciples by their love for one another. There should be the fruit of love in this church. And where there's not, then we've left our first love. And the Bible would say, remember from where you have fallen, repent and do your first works again sincere love is an ultimate value, value. Then comes this fifth one. And this is one you've probably seen and some of you have not been used to before, but it goes back to the original vision, which is the active participation. Not the passive spectating, but the active participation of the body. Okay? We give space in this church for people to pray out loud, to speak out loud, to share, to be a part of things. 
Uh, it's not a prayer service where you're all going to be quiet and one person's going to pray up at the front, just the leaders. It's going to be everyone praying and praying for one another and praying for healing and laying on of hands. We're going to be a church that's going to see the body of the church, you know, functioning. And, and, and that's why in order to be a church of the body, we have to know that we all have different parts to our body. Some of us are gifted in different ways. We have all people serving in this church in different capacities. We want you to serve in the church. If you're not serving in our church right now, the question is either you're brand new and you just need to settle in for a little bit and learn our vision and learn our practice of the church. But if you've been here for a while and you've, you know, have already gone through three months or, or more, you've been in this fellowship, depending on what ministry it is, we, we love to see you actively serving where we can count on you and put you in schedules for different things or just... And even from the very beginning, you're welcome to participate as an active participant in our prayer meetings, in our different things. We, we don't sort of say, you can't pray until you, th th we might not give you a responsibility right away, but you are welcome to be involved in the body life right from the beginning because we believe in the active participation of the body. And then I want to talk about this one, which is the overflow of gospel witness, okay? The overflow which is of Christ's mission, okay? Christ-centered, okay, gospel witness. We want to be a church that is interested in the lost. We want to be a church that's interested in people who are hurting, people who are in need in our community. And that's why in our church, we've, you know, do, done a lot of different things. We have a Spanish service to reach the Spanish people, speaking people of our community. And um, the only reason why we're not all together all the time is because they don't know English as well to hear the Bible study at the level they want to learn it as they would if they heard it in Spanish and vice versa. If we heard a Bible study in Spanish, we wouldn't be able to get things out of it. But God is working on helping to break down that language barrier and we could do more and more ministry with our Spanish speaking brethren. And God's been doing some wonderful things. And when we do outreaches there, we do coat drives in the winter. We've done prayer tents. We did it all through COVID. We've been out in our community, walking and down the streets. We've done house-to-house -house visits in our saturated outreaches. We have reached out to every single home in the entire Freehold Borough just about now. Um, we are concerned about our gospel witness because we want to reach people for Christ. We want to build bridges with people. We want to be servants to them. And we want to make a difference wherever we can in that way. So we've got Jesus Christ, the Word, the Holy Spirit, sincere love, the body, and gospel witness. And that is a huge part of our priorities, but there's one more. One more that we're going to add on here, which is the commitment. The commitment to advance. And what is next? What do we want to advance? God's kingdom. We are wanting to be kingdom-minded people. And by, by that, we are committed to not just Living Springs, but to the well-being of Christian testimony all over the area and the expanse of the gospel throughout the world. We have missionaries that we support in India, in Nigeria, in um, the Philippines, in Haiti, in across America, and we have people that we're still partnering up with, both the church I planted in England and a new missionary we're, I'm going to be trying to get out to see that started from the Christian Missionary Alliance that's planting a church in England. We are trying to reach around the world and building relationships, partnerships, where we can support financially and relationally and with teams and hopefully even prayerfully send out missionaries from this church to plant churches and to see more things take place in missions around the world. And so that represents our core values, our purpose, our vision. You've heard the history. You've heard that. Sh the, some of you have heard some of this before, but tonight you need to hear it all together because it's a biblical vision. It's a biblical plan. And, and you know, the church was first given in mystery when Adam was put to sleep and out of his side came a bride and the bride was brought to Jesus. We learn in Ephesians 5, it was a great mystery about Christ and the church. So the church is a mystery, but the church has history. The church has been expanding for 2,000 years. And in the history of the church, there's all a lot of forms 
There's been a lot of fractions. There's been a lot of, of um, factions, I should say. There's been a lot of denominations, a lot of movements, spiritual awakenings, revivals. There's been apostasy and her- heresy, and there's been difficulty, and there's been division, and there's been, there's been healings, and there's been um, feuds and fights. There's been, listen, the history of the church has the good, the bad, the ugly, but the, the amazing thing is it has God being faithful to his promise that he's going to build this church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And many times his revivals and his awakenings are to pour out his spirit to burn away some of the things that mankind has built up. Just like in the Tower of Babel, when God came down and confused languages, well, sometimes God comes down and he begins to bring that spirit fire of burning away things that just needed to burn away to get people back to purity, surety, to making the main thing the main thing because that's the main thing and getting people back to see Jesus and really, hopefully, allowing these things to be actively present in his churches. But the church is also not just a revelation where Christ said, I will build my church upon this rock. We talked about the rock as the revelation of who Jesus is, but it's also in multiplication. Churches are being planted every single day. All over the world, there's new churches being planted. Some great, some okay, and some maybe not true churches. Only God knows. And Jesus determines what's what he uh, is pleased with. If you read Revelation chapters two and three, you see what Jesus commends. You see what Jesus corrects. You see what he confirms. You see what he sort of has to adjust. And some churches have left their first love and some are compromised and some are corrupt and some need to get back to the word and some need to get back to worship. Some need to bring the Holy Spirit back in. You know, there's a lot of different aspects to what makes up the church. So that's just the presentation I wanted to give tonight, just in bringing the story, the narrative, the background. I hope it's exciting for you that you're a part of a 2,000-year history of what Jesus has been doing to build his church. It's a beautiful thing, and you're a part of it. And God has a ministry and a mission for you to fulfill in this. So Mike and and Jim, why don't you guys come up right now first? And um, let me just open it up. I'd like to um, first maybe start with these dear brothers. Jim, come on up as well. See if there's anything that you guys might just want to add as, a, as an imi- kind of an immediate thing after hearing all that, Mike. You know, a lot of that's review for you, obviously, and review for you, Jim. Thank you. But if there's anything you guys wanted to add before we open up for the body to ask questions or thoughts, did you, anything that you guys want to add on your, because you, you had it from a different angle on your side, Mike, and how you were a part of it. Mike, by the way, and his wife, Christine, were there at our very first official public meeting for Calvary Cambridge in the UK. They flew out and were a part of that service. And Mike and and Christine had served with me in youth ministry in the years past. So we have a lot of history together in in terms of that. And then when we were back, he was a part of that prayer team and the core team and the beginnings of all that and was our our first elder in the church. So Mike, let me just turn it over to you. If there's anything you want to add first or do you want to say anything related to this whole picture? Yeah, (laughs) there was... um I love the, uh, right here, um, being an active participant, not just a spectator, but being an active participant. Um, I think in in all the church that I knew growing up, and I I come from a Catholic background, I was an altar boy, and I went through those years of, of, of just understanding the Mass and so on and so forth and doing that. Then getting saved in 1995, April 29th, 1995, I got saved in in Southern California, but I was in Northern California uh, fishing. And I got saved. And so then after that, that's where everything just began to get very exciting. And I'd been to um, Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, some of their men's uh, uh, you know, outreaches and so on and so forth, the men's conferences. And uh, a lot of times I'd go when Chuck Smith would be at the amphitheater and he would do the Easter uh, um Communion. Easter, 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 yeah, you know. Easter communion service. And so, you know, I, 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 was, a, I was around it, but I... The first church I went to was very structured. Uh, it was more cessationist, and so there was not a belief in the spirit uh, being relevant in the new church or the church today, but rather that uh, that was for the miraculous, was for the starting of the church and, and bringing it forth, as we see with you know Ananias and Sapphira and you know how the Holy Spirit you know um, slew them, slayed them uh, for lying. And you would say, gosh, how many people would be dead today if you know, the Holy Spirit was working that way? Um, so, you know, uh, but, but it's not to get long-winded on it, but the, the thing that was 
the most, when Joey and I would have our talks, he'd come back from England and we would just spend a lot of time together. And uh, this idea of, he once asked me, he says, Mike, what is the church? And, you know, just questions like that, that, you know, you have an answer for it. We all know what the church is, but yet when you're asked that question, you go, uh, uh, and he would laugh at me and, he, and then he'd go, well, what about this and what about that? And, you know, uh, you know, the church is the people. I, most people would say, well, the church isn't the building, it's the people. But then when you just think about what, what did Christ mean by the church, you know, and on this, you know, I will build my church. And so um, I, I think this, this active participation of the body is, is um, so much what I always felt, because I would be in that cessation church, and I'd be raising my hand, and he'd go, Mike, we don't, we don't raise hands here. And, and Christian and I, we started raising our hands, and a few people would kind of do one of these things, you know, and, and, uh, and, and so, and, and, but, but um, when I found out that, you know, when, when Joey and I would have these conversations, that's when things get exciting, is when I'm allowed to allow for my gifts to be expressed in the context of a meeting. Um, of, of worship surface and and so and not, I don't have to just sit there because that's what we are taught in America is that you sit the pastor has all the answers and even the pulpit is put up higher so that he can kind of look down and 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 so and everything's built but if you notice Joey when we first came into this place was is there any way that I can be on the ground you know because there was just this idea of of us being many. Um, then that was the idea, is that the church is, is a group of people. Yes, there is a neck, and there is, Jesus, is, of course, is, is, is the head of the church. Um, mm-hmm. But we are all ha- using our gifts, Joey adequately using his gift of not only uh, teaching, but just that shepherding heart. And so, and I've watched Jim, as he is, and I have gotten to know each other, and, and just his administrative qualities, and how he loves the Lord as well. And I've watched, I can just go through, and I can look at all these, and say, I see this, 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 this. And that's the beautiful part about it is that, you know, the church was meant to not just be one person, well, one person, Jesus Christ, but um, it would, the church was meant to be many members, one body. Yeah. And so I see that being uh, lived out here at Living Springs because of the active participation of those being allowed to share during a service. So that's, that's what I uh, would bring to that's my sharing of, that's, that's a distinctive, I think, of uh, Living Springs Fellowship, and uh, you guys should be really grateful to be able to express what's on your heart. So, yeah, thanks, Mike. And just before you share, Jim, just one thing that to kind of highlight something Mike said. When we were in England, England has these old church. I mean, some of the church buildings in England were a thousand years old. I mean, they had a church that was built in 1030, and uh, I went going to these buildings and be like, wow, this thing's like three times older than America, you know. And um, as Mike was saying, they had these elevated pulpits and different things. Now, see, a lot of times we don't ask questions like, why do they do that? Now, there was actually a good reason why that was done. You see, if you read the book of Ezra, there was a wooden platform that was raised to elevate the law of God when the people had forgotten the word of God. A wooden platform was built up and the word went out so that the word was high. But what would slowly begin to happen if the word wasn't given its place, the clergyman becomes high, or the person that's reading the word becomes higher, not the word itself. And so when you study church history, which unfortunately a lot of Christians have not done, most of you read the book of Acts, and then you're living today in, 20, in the 21st century, and you have very little understanding of what took place in the 2,000 years of church history. So many different things happen to react to different things that the church was you know, overemphasizing here or underemphasizing there or responding to in this way. And that's why we have denominations, by the way. And that's why there's different church expressions. And I just want to say this. Let us not be critical in thinking that, you know, we're the only church that is trying to do it right or, or seeking God's will or, you know, this is the, the, the real church and everybody else is a false church. That is not the case. God is working through all kinds of churches and different denominations and backgrounds Um, In England, they call some things high church and low church, and some of that has to do with the formality and the liturgy. Others of it has to do with uh, um, whether the church was able to break away from certain, you know, uh, church government authorities and so forth. All that to say is the church should be examined by the Bible. It should carry with it a continuity of certain 
you know, creeds and, and um, you know, important doctrinal things that the church has had to, you know, make sure that they stayed unified in throughout church history. You study those things like the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed and the Cald- uh, Caldosian and all of these kind of things. Th- these, these are things that the church had to do to make sure that when interference and enemies of the church were trying to change the doctrines, they banded together, they came together, they prayed together, and they made sure they established those right statements and those so forth. So the church has a lot of history, and it's our job to seek, as the Bible would say, endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Not create unity, but keep the unity that God already started, and at the same time, make sure it's centered around Jesus and the gospel and the atoning work of the cross correctly, rightly, and biblically. And, and so that's really important. A lot of us come from different backgrounds. As Mike said, you know, we all, some of you started from, you know, a, a church tradition that was very different than what you have now. But if you've made changes, I pray it's because the Holy Spirit showed you something, revealed something to you. You got into the Bible more and you started saying, you know, the, what about when the Bible teaches this and more of that? That That's really where we want to, you know, be looking. So, Jim, what were some of your thoughts you want to add well, today? What I love about what God is doing at Living Springs, and it is God doing the work here. It's not any one of us. God is doing the work here. Amen. Is this whole board right here, right? This tells it all. When I see this vision, to see Christ glorified, to be the church edified, to free the Living Spring and every believer. Now, we, hopefully every church wants to see Christ glorified, right? But these two, this be the church edified and to free the living spring in every believer, I think that's what makes a big difference in this place, that we concentrate on his being. Because what I like to say, what I learned from Brother Joey is, we want to be before we do. Amen. And if we're not being in the spirit, being in alignment with God, you know, that makes a whole difference in our walk. You have to be in alignment. You have to be in the spirit then the doing is going to come naturally in a supernatural way. Then you're going to want to do it. It's going to happen organically. All that doing stuff that we all get caught up in doing, 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 doing. But first, we need to learn how to be. And that's what mm-hmm. I think makes a big difference. That I, I, I remember when I came to the first Living Springs gathering at the house, I didn't want to go. I didn't want to go to house service. I was at a church for over 30 years, and every, everything was structured you know, the way churches go. And I was thinking, oh, what's going to go on in this house? <laughs> but let me tell you, when I first got there, 10 minutes in, into being into that house, I knew something was different. It was straight out of the book of Acts. They were just breaking bread and sharing. And there was joy. You can tell the spirit was, was present there. And it was just a peace. It was something different that I never even felt before. And my wife and I, she can attest to this as well. We're like, this is different. This is, this is good. This is good. I remember Brother Frank there with his big pot of macaroni or something. <laughs> I, I finished my plate. He was like, here, have more. Here, have more. Have more. I'm like, all right, all right. Yeah. Listen, we good. eat really good yeah. at Living Springs. I think we've got yeah. a lot of great, great, great cooks oh, in yeah, this we fellowship. Have, <laughs> we love our food here. But one more thing. When we come down here, we see the feeding of the word. The word. Something Joey said on on Sunday that he mentioned again tonight was, if we're not, if we don't know his word, how can we know him? And that is so important, right? John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word, word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, Amen. right? And it's just, if we don't know that word, if we're not digging into that word, and this is what's cultivated here. Right, cultivated by Brother Joey and everyone here to be in that word, being fed every single day, right? Mm-hmm. Psalm 1 says to meditate on his law both day and night, right? And that meditation, like considering his word, right? That's where it all starts. And all this stuff that's being cultivated here at Living Springs and just being, being the body. That's what I love about Living Springs. We are the body. Amen. So, yeah. That's great, Jim. Awesome. So, um, over to you guys. You know, as you took all that in tonight, for those of you who have been around for a while, a lot of that you, you've known, maybe you never heard it all put together in one clean, you know, narrative like that. Uh, but maybe tonight it also has you thinking and maybe some questions about, like, just more about our church family, um, things we do, things we're wanting to do, um, questions you might have, just any of that. Anybody want to 
add uh, a question or without clarity on something, or you'd like to know a little bit more about any any of the things we mentioned. Yes, yes. Um, one of our so newer sisters. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, go ahead. With uh, being the church edified yeah. for the living spring and um, being active participants in the body, mm -hmm. sometimes it's hard for people to learn in group settings and need something more intimate. Yes. So are there opportunities for one-on-one -on -one discipleship or smaller settings and areas where people should learn how to uh, actively participate before being comfortable in a bigger setting? Yeah, it's a great, great question. So just to sum up the question is, especially when someone's new to the fellowship, you know, and they see, you know, even our, uh, our church is growing, but, you know, we have enough people in this church to where if you're brand new, you're not going to know everybody, and how can you get more personalized, and do we have smaller groups? Well, our church rotates into doing seasons of home groups, home fellowships, where we break up into smaller groups in homes for a season, and then we'll come back for things like this. Let's get, a, you know, get the body back together for a Friday night teaching or series of something. So we go in and out of home groups and, and gatherings like this to, to teach and equip the body um, on various topics. We did the Life in the Spirit series before this foundation series. Um, but also, you mentioned one-on-one -on -one discipleship and everything. Both our men's and women's ministry has even smaller groups within each of those ministries. The women's group, you, if you come to, you know, all the women are together, then they break up into small groups and discuss things and go deeper. And then the women are getting together one-on-one -on -one and there's discipleship happening there. And the same thing is happening with the men, small groups that get broken out of that. Um, what we don't necessarily have is a formality necessarily yet of, of, of developing, you know, let's say a, a pipeline of like, if you, but if you want to get discipled and you want to go deeper, like a lot of us are doing that on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, but sometimes that comes by a communication and a relationship form and saying, hey, I'd like to spend time with you for a season, just really investing in you and going over things. And I think that that is a really needed thing. And I'm glad you brought that up because that is exactly what we need. We need more personalized discipleship where we're training and teaching and we're listening and we're hearing each other's stories and we're finding out where the gaps are, where people's weaknesses are and how we can hone in and see people brought to maturity. So that is a huge part of our heart and vision. But some of that's happening organically. Some of it happens within the ministries we've established. And then some of it needs to happen more formally with, you know, even asking. As you, you know, you might say, hey, I, I want a, a someone more mature than me to kind of walk me, you know, where I'm at and bring me further. And uh, we encourage if anybody's sitting here and you want that, to let, let that be known. You know, share that. Because um, there's definitely men and women who would want to sit down and uh, minister, you know, to you um, in that way. So that's a, that's a wonderful question. And, and yeah, just to add on to that, even on a Tuesday night where it's a smaller setting, more intimate, we sometimes break up into smaller groups and we pray together because not everybody's comfortable praying out loud or whatever. Even the disciples yes, teach us to pray, right? So in those settings as well. Yeah, great. Yes. Hey, Mm -hmm. Which I think is a great idea, by the way. But uh, we do that sort of offline. Yeah. Or, uh, what's so, so to, to ask about that, what is, what is the church's guidance or advice on how people should see giving to Christ? Yeah, great question. So the question is, you know, what is this church's position on, on giving in the church? Um, how do you give in the church? And, and, and David made the observation, we don't pass a plate or a bag here in this church. We never have. We don't plan on doing so. So how do you give? Well, we have boxes that are in various points of the church. We trust this, first of all, that if somebody commits themselves to this fellowship and they begin to hear the Bible and they understand this is their church family, that they will desire to give to the church, not out of obligation or any forced hand, but because they understand the principle of giving back to God and, and giving to his work and to the church that they're a part of. And so... We create that opportunity through those boxes and we create the opportunity through online giving, which is on our website. You just click on giving up at the top and you can set up an online giving. And then of course, besides checks that could be written out to our Fellowship of Living Springs Fellowship or this, um, those, those giving boxes, uh, there's even an app that you can download and, and um, all of that is on the website as well that you can go through or you go to the connect table and, and that can be um, given to you. But as far as the philosophy behind that, you know, because I think one, culturally, that when brand new people come to the fellowship or people are coming, you know, we want it to be an act of worship. 
And if it's brought to you rather than you bringing it to God, sure, it might make it more convenient for the people, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's driving the person to take the initiative. And we never want people to think that the church is about that or you know, pushing that or forcing that, but we know that the church can only really exist to rent a building or to do the things it does by the generous giving of its body. Um, that's how you know, I'm able to even serve in the church in a full capacity, full time. That's how this church building is able to be rented. That's how we can support missionaries. That's how we can do outreach the way we do it is through the giving of the body. And we believe it should be done generously. It should be done joyfully. It should be as an act of worship. And, um, you know, tithing is not a principle that's necessarily um, reiterated in the New Testament in the same way. It's more about generous giving. You know, if, if the Old Testament by law had to give tenth. The new covenant was built upon how can we give even more or how can we give at least that or whatever it may be. I, I see as Lewis once said, it should cost you something. You know, if life is so easy where you never feel like you are even having to sacrifice anything in your life. Um, many different writers and George Mueller and different people who prayed for God to provide and, and to do the orphanages, we, we have to trust the Lord. We have to guide, um, we have to allow the Holy Spirit to guide our church, which includes providing for our church and moving it on the hearts of people to give. And, um, and that's been a beautiful thing is to see how the Lord has taken care of the needs of this church through that, um, just through the Spirit doing that. And we, we will pray more uh, at different times for the giving of the church at, at different times. We, we recognize sometimes we, we haven't reminded new people how to do it, so that's why that's such an appropriate question. But that's kind of the philosophy behind it. And we, we really do believe that giving is a wonderful part of your Christian life. We believe it's a practice that is sort of taught in Scripture, Old and New Testament, but we see that it's a spirit-led um, and, and, and worshipful, generous way of doing that. And, and, it's, and it's wonderful when you know that you can never outgive God, that, that when you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, he meets all of your practical needs. And I've seen that in my own life. Um, I know all of us can testify of it, that God is just faithful um, as we seek to honor him first with our first fruits. So, great question. Yeah. Yeah, Angela. I think it's an appropriate question to answer here tonight is um, some churches are big on formal membership. Other churches, denominations, don't have formal membership. Can you explain where Living Springs lands when it comes to that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Does Living Springs have formal membership? Do we consider it informal <laughs> membership? Um, are we automatically already members of the church? And the answer to all three of those questions is yes, yes. Yes. <laughs> so um, ultimately, if you follow the blueprints of what we said, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you have the Holy Spirit in you, you are a member of the bigger church, the body of Christ. But as we said before, you can only really live out your Christian faith in a local church. You can't just sort of say, I'm a member of all the churches all over the world. And because it, although that might be true spiritually and positionally, it's not practically true because if nobody knows who you are and you have no accountability and no submission to any eldership or or no way to participate in these kind of ways, then, then you're not really a true active member of any church if you're so loosely connected. Yeah. So, so, you, so we, we believe that you are automatically a member of the body of Christ just by definition of the Holy Spirit being in you. But to be an active member of the local church you're a part of, there's ways to do that. Now, giving is one of the ways that people show their commitment to their local church. We already talked about that. But in this church... We wanted foundations to be something we do kind of as a, a way going forward. We want all the people who are part of this church to go through this course. That's why we've stressed this, you know, even in this time around. And um, we, we want to see how we can get you plugged in and, and, and get to know you. We have the church directory. And anybody who puts themselves in the church directory, that kind of is saying, you call this your home church, and this directory is allowing everybody to see who's committed themselves in this local church in that way. That's another way. So besides you know, what would be financially given, and there's records, and, you know, we hire people, and we can make sure that's all done correctly and done legally and done rightfully, and I don't touch any money whatsoever, so <laughs> never something I do. And we have all the right people in place for that, and so that's one way. The directory is another way, and then we believe that the other way is through your commitment in your service to the Lord and how you plug yourself in and, and serve, and so we we will have an annual church meeting every year, and there are certain things that only our members will get to participate in. If we were making decisions about a building, if we were making important decisions about, like we have a board that we established in this church that takes care of our um, 
fiduciary responsibilities and so forth. And that board will have to go through a process of re-putting new members in that. But when it comes time to put new members in that board, we'll have like a church meeting and you'll be involved in that process of getting to know exactly who's doing that and hear more about what our church, you know, where our budget's going. And, and so for the people who are church members and you're part of that directory and you, we would say, are part of our official membership, you'd be a part of those meetings and have a right to take part when we affirm things or, you know, need to vote on something or things like that. So, but it's a bit more informal than certain churches. We don't make anybody sign anything and, and it's not like a format like that. And we don't have certain policies that maybe other churches do in that regard, but we just want to be as biblical as possible and at the same time be as practical as possible to make it real and, and connected. And, uh, and we're trying to just find that balance in, in the midst of all of that. And so we, we believe church membership is really important because a lot of people just date the church. They just kind of like dip in, dip out, kind of, <laughs> I'm going on a date with this church, now I'm going to go on a date with that church. And, and as a result, um, there's no commitment, there's no covenant, and there's no sense of accountability. And that's really what's needed when it comes to church membership, that you know who your elders are, and the elders know who you are, and, uh, and the church knows who you are, and anybody can contact you in this church. When, you know, and if you don't like that or you don't want that, you have to ask yourself, why? Why would I not want to be a member of a church where people know my name, know who I am, and that I have accountability and relationship with the, with the, the leadership and the people of that body? So that, that's what membership exists for, and that, that's what we understand it to be, and so I hope that adequately answered that question. And so that's a great question, and it's a perfect question for, for tonight. So um, excellent. Yeah, anyone else? Um, yes. Yes. I love the questions from newer people because you guys ask the perfect questions. Yeah, great, great question. Um, so... Um, Jim was a deacon before he was an elder, and we have Paul Stallone, who's one of our deacons in the church, and we had a team of a few more deacons. One of them moved away. Um, Dennis, the one I had mentioned to before, is down in North Carolina now. Um, we've had people that serve for a period of time as deacons, and they're no longer, and we're going to be raising up some new deacons. So yes, to answer your question, we, we do have deacons, and, we, and we'll continue to see practical, uh, because the difference between a deacon and an elder primarily is um, the elders are responsible before God as the overseers to look after the spiritual nurture and care of the church, to make sure that the blueprints of the church and the values and the discipleship is taking place. And they set a good example of being um, those who are, who are carrying out that responsibility and caring for the people of this church and uh, are available for you in that way. The, the deacons, like all of us, we're all called to disciple. We're all called to spiritually serve. But the deacons will be given responsibilities on practical things, taking care of the building, taking care of you know, various practical different things. And we will continue to raise up new deacons in that. Um, we have another category. Uh, besides the spiritual elders and the practical deacons, we have overseers of ministries. They may not be an elder, they may not be a deacon, but they've been given the responsibility to oversee the children's ministry or the hospitality team or greeters or ushering or you know, um, all these different aspects you know, looking out for the church, you know, watching, keeping a watchful eye. Um, all these different ministries that exist have ministry overseers and teams that are serving underneath those things. So we, we, we just kind of break it all down like we see in the scriptural breakdown. And uh, we recognize that for those that are going to take the highest level of being an elder, there's a, there's a biblical requirement that needs to be met for that, as well as for deacons, as setting a good example to others. But we're all called to serve in the church. We're all called to disciple and be discipled and to be a body that, as we said, functions as a body. So, yeah, Mike. Yeah, and, and one of the things that, if I could just jump off of that, um, you know, for you that are here and then, you know, we, we, we from time to time make it make known um, on Sundays, but, um, you know, you all have gifts. And, and one of the ways, again, as was adequately said by Brother Joey, is, is that using your gifts in the context of the church um, and, and, and all of you can do something, and, and, and I get it, you know, it, it costs, ministry does cost, it's never convenient, very, very little is it convenient, it's greatly rewarding, but um, it, it tends to take place, you know, when you're ready to, to stop for the day, and then ministry starts, but even within the context of the church, and we could do so much more as a church if more people came forward and said, how can I help? Mm -hmm. And, and, and just, just as you have received 
from the consistent teaching that you have and the, 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 the things. Yes, you give up your tithes. That's wonderful. Um, but, but quite honestly, I think we could even do more if people would just come forward and say, what can I do? And just have that, that willingness to say, what can I do? And it might not be on, as, a, as, a, as an overseer, but it might be, look, we're putting this, you know, this outreach together or whatever it is. We need people to come and fill bags or whatever it is. Having that makes it so much of a greater um, thing for us that we can do more. And we want to do more. We want to, we want to give God our best. So um, keep, always keeping that in mind. And again, some, some people can, cannot. But, but it, it is really important for you to understand that your, your muscle or whatever you want to call it, or your spirit or your heart, because we do serve God with our spirit. Um, but if you could come and give of that, that part of you that can help, um, it's always something just to be prayerful about, for sure. Yeah. And, 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 you know, even the very microphone that Mike is using has to be turned on. And we have a sound team and a video team. And you know, when we went through the COVID season, you know, my son Josiah helped us to get going on to our YouTube channel and getting all the things that we had going. And, and, um, and you know, we, we have needs that come up at different times. You know, people go away. Like, you know, uh, my daughter went away to school. My son's going to be going away to school uh, at some point this year as well. So, you know, we see gaps that open up and we need people to come and fill those gaps. So sometimes, as Mike rightly said, you know, you offering yourself is a great way to help us out, but also we'll let you know, like, hey, we have needs. Like, we have a need in this area, we have a need in this ministry, and maybe the Holy Spirit just says, you know, I've done that before, or I don't know how to do that, but I would love to learn if that can be a blessing for the church, and we'll train you, and we'll teach you, and we'll show you. Um, you know, the graphics that you see, you know, like Carol does those, and we have event planning, and Patty helps us with that, and we have, you know, look around this room, and, and we have so many different people who are serving and helping in so many different ways, but, but we need more um, to help so that they're not the only people doing it, and then they can, we don't want anybody to feel like, like so much is, is falling on them, and then they're missing out on opportunities to be with the body because the responsibilities are building up on them. So we never want people to, and I love what Jim said, you know, the, a philosophy that we stress all the time is we want to be before we do. We want to be before we do. Meaning, we don't find our identity in what we do. We first find our identity in who we are. That's right. God wants us to be relational with him and with each other as a huge part of our influence, more than just what jobs do you do. Because spiritual maturity is not how much you know, nor is it how much you do. It's who you know. And it's how you do it that really shows how mature you've become. And so we have the what, why, who principle. What do you do? Why do you do what you do? And who do you do it for? And we stress that, and we, 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 we look at Jesus as the chief shepherd of this church, and I serve under Jesus as an under-shepherd, and we're under-shepherds, and we, we're all servants, um, but we're first sons, sons and daughters, learning how to be like Mary, sitting at the feet of Jesus, receiving, and then once we receive, our giving is out of an overflow of love and gratitude in worship to the Lord. So, yeah, great questions, great thoughts. Um, I think that's good. One last one. Yeah.
Yeah. And he will do that. And he's, be sure, be sure as the weather will come, he will do that in your life. He will stretch you. And let's just face it, we are in a day and age where we are going to be stretched way more than we ever have been. What a time to be living. Yeah, that's so great. I don't say just jump into something and you can't stand it. I'm saying yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know, that, that's such a good point. And I didn't want to turn this into a servant to thing. I saw him say this very briefly. But Mary Ruth had said something about discipleship. Do you know when I first started coming, uh, I was at Calvary Chapel for a while. I was an elder there. But I, um, when I first went there, it was just I was just available. And uh, a big church of 4,000 people became very small um, when I began serving. I, you know, you get there a little early and you're with a couple people. You're praying first. And all of a sudden, that discipleship starts becoming very organic. Because those people that are there are, are people that are just giving of themselves as well. And that's a really good indication of somebody who has the potential to continue to, um, to, to grow. And one of the things is, is that things that I didn't think I could do, I found out, you know what, I really like doing this. Mm-hmm. And so if you, if you just, sometimes it's just good just trying stuff out. But I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, again, this wasn't for that, that purpose. But it's really important that for, you to, for you to understand that's one of the things about this church that if you're coming to this church, you got to understand is that you get to be part of this church and you can use your gifts, whatever they are, or even just use your kindness of saying, how can I clean up or what can I do? And so um, these types of things. And it does, you'll be surprised the people that are around you, you start to get these little groups of people that you're cleaning with or you're doing stuff with. And then it allows the the overseers and and to to have more time to do more planning, more vision casting. So it really helps. So that's it. Yeah, one last thing on this. We won't beat a dead horse. But, (laughs) but, you know, what Michael said about availability. We all know our availability. God knows your availability. And some of us, you know, not me, but some of you guys have small children, right? And that's your ministry at this season. This is the season that you're in right there. So that's what you need to concentrate. If you have small children, Mike said right from the get-go, pray. Pray about where God wants you to serve. If you're, you need to serve in your household with your family and your children, that's where you need to be. Amen. And we want to support one another because we know that we have all ages in this church. And we would love for our young, the young littles in this church to feel like they got all kinds of aunts and uncles from the various families. We want... Um, the older women to be like mothers and the older men to be like fathers. We want the brothers and the sisters to just to feel like there's family here. And to cultivate that, it requires us to to really give of our time. We have to break through some of our westernized individualistic cultural patterns where it's like, I go to work and I'll maybe go to church on a Sunday and everything else is my life and all this. Well, you could live like that. I mean, but you'll never grasp the fullness of God's church if you don't seek to be a part of things more than just even once a week, you know? Because the church met from house to house with gladness and simplicity of heart in the early church days, but they all lived in the same village. They walked to each other's homes a little easier. Well, we have people spread out, but it's possible because of cars, but you know, that's commuting, and some people live closer, and some people live further. So there's family factors, there's distant factors, there's work-related schedule factors. But do your best to say, God, how can I seek first your kingdom and even plan my schedule in my week around what my local church family is doing? If my local church family meets on these nights and this, well, let me try to keep those nights free and then I can do these other things on these other times. You know, that's the way you have to try to think to be intentional if you want to really be connected well to the church family you're a part of. And I just want to close with this tonight. In the end of 2 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul says these words. Finally, brethren, he says, become complete. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of of the Holy Spirit be with you all. 
Amen. Isn't that a beautiful way to end our foundation series? And uh, thanks for being a part of this. For all of you who went all six weeks, wonderful. We're so proud that you took the whole course. And if you missed one, uh, we did record these, um, but we want you to sign up for the ones that you actually attended and went to. Um, so uh, most of these now are available um, on our site. But let's close in a word of prayer. And uh, let's ask God to continue to put this into practice in our lives and in this church. Father, thank you for a wonderful night and a great last six weeks here of building up our foundations, remembering, God, that your word is what brings things into being. You speak, and then it exists. And you speak in your word, but you also direct your people by your spirit. And you build your church, and we get to be a part of that and we get to speak one to another words of life. We get to show love one to another and express your heart. We get to, Lord, live together as a community of people on a mission, the co-mission, the great co-mission, where, Lord, we seek to glorify you as people who are followers of Jesus, who are full of your word, filled with your spirit, that we might fulfill Christ's mission of making disciples who will make more disciples. Lord, let us be committed to that. Let us have more influence in the days ahead. Let us grow in our unity and in our love for you and our love for one another. And Lord, let the lampstand of Living Springs Fellowship always be burning bright for you. God, may we always seek to give you the glory and the honor and the praise. And Lord, help us, God, to never lose sight that you who began the good work in us will complete it until the day of the Lord. We praise you and thank you for this wonderful night and the weeks that we've had. Lead us from here, Lord, and grow us in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore. For endless days we will sing your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, our God. We bless your holy name, Jesus. And we love you so much, we Lord. <laughs> and we all said? Yeah. Amen. All right. Let's fellowship together and